Welcome, everyone. I'm going to get us started with some brief logistics and um, information about the webinar. My name is Dr. Anna Chodos. You'll see my name and picture in a second, but I just really wanted to welcome everyone to our webinar today for the month of March for Dementia Care Aware. The title today is Cultural and Language Considerations for Cognitive Assessments with a special focus on Filipino Americans. And our presenter today is going to be Jessica DeLeon, a doctor in, who's an assistant professor of neurology here at UCSF. Um, next slide, please. So this is us, and you're going to hear Dr. DeLeon speak for most of our presentation, of course. And I'm going to help just get us started with logistics and moderate our questions at the end. So next slide, please. Some brief housekeeping for everyone on today. We are gonna leave uh, time for questions at the end of the session. And there, I know there's a case uh, in our presentation today, and we may just leave that for the slides if we wanna make sure to get time for questions. Um, just to point out, if you put questions in the chat and in the q and I'll be looking at that throughout the webinar and I'll be sure to take note. We'll be sure to try to get them answered. So the more questions you put in there, probably the more time we'll leave at the end to really address them and have a conversation about them. Just so you know, we'll also give instructions for how to claim your continuing education and continuing medical education credits at the end of this webinar. And you'll um, also get an email within the next 48 hours on how to claim that credit. So we, and we really want you to take advantage of those education credits. So please take note. We'll also, of course, we're recording now and we'll post the recording on our website and that'll be later available on our YouTube channel within the next 48 hours. And we'll also be sure to give you access to the slides. So we wanna make sure that you have the information, you can process it now and enjoy watching the presentation. And then you can rewatch and get the, information on the slides, including all the great references for this particular talk um, by getting the slides at the end. Next slide. As usual, I just want to remind everybody, we are a big program and we're across the state of California. We're here to support you. I want to make sure you know about all the things that you see here. So our warm line is a live phone conversation that you can have from Monday through Friday, nine to five with an expert in dementia care. They're particularly expert in our program and how to do the screening and how to implement the screen, but we have expertise across all aspects of dementia care for the primary care environment. We have so many trainings, they're online. You can get all of that via our website, dementiacareaware.org. You can watch additional monthly webinars and watch recorded ones on our website. And then um, you can also access our podcast. Just to point out, all of these things have continuing education credits. Finally, um, we have uh, ongoing and access and information about live case conferences through the ECHO model that are led through UCLA and UCI. Uh, Alzheimer's Association also has numerous ECHO programs, and we have some information about those. And then finally, there's still the opportunity to get direct coaching support for your practice change within your practice. And um, that's through the UCLA Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Program and the Alzheimer's Association Health Systems Branch. So we have so many good resources to really implement dementia screening and some of the things we're gonna learn today. And I just wanna make sure you have ample opportunity to know about them. Next slide, please. So this is our training. Many of you, I hope, know it well, but just to point out, we really have this core training, the cognitive health assessment. That is the approach that we're teaching to screen for dementia in primary care. That's quick and meant to be an annual screen for older adults. And this is our core course that you can get online and also through multiple live training opportunities that you can find information for on our website. Um, and just want to re-emphasize that this is sort of the core of what we talk about because it really starts with early detection of dementia and screening. So next slide. So I always like to review what it is we're even talking about. So everything we talk about dementia care where really builds off the Medi-Cal um, approach to screening the cognitive health assessment that we've been teaching through Dementia Care Aware. And it's meant to be an annual screen and it's three components, a brief history, 
often just a question or it may even be a provider or a primary care team member noticing a sign of cognitive change, then applying validated screening tools for cognition and function that are very brief, but that really address the core components of dementia, cognitive decline and functional decline, and then a brief assessment and documentation of a care partner. So do you have someone in your life that supports you in, around medical decisions? Who is that person? Can I document them today? Terrific. That's the, the kind of thing we're talking about. So um, there are trainings, all of our trainings go into this in greater depth, but just want to sort of get us all on the same page as we launch into more information about our special topic today. Next slide, please. So again, here's our upcoming live sessions. Um, we have many every single week. So, and they're led by all of our incredibly talented and trained partners. So we just really want you to take advantage of this opportunity while we have it in, in great supply at the moment. Next slide, please. So just wanna point out, we've uh, reviewed the disclosures of our speaker today. She has no financial disclosures. And um, after that exciting announcement, I'm gonna pass it on to her to really take us into the topic for today. And thank you so much, Dr. DeLeon. Good to see you all. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, so a brief outline of what we'd like to go over today. Um, I'll start by just talking a little bit about the Philippines um, and the Filipino diaspora. I'll talk a little bit about languages since it'll be quite relevant for what we speak about today. Um, and then I'll start from what the diaspora looks like around the world and narrow in to California, um, where many of us are practicing. Um, talk a little bit about what is known about dementia and Filipinos, Filipino American. Uh, and we'll spend the majority of our time today discussing different language considerations um, we might think about for cognitive assessment as well as some cultural um, some cultural considerations as well. Um, um, our learning objectives, um, I'm hoping at the end of this, we'll be able to describe some language considerations for cognitive testing um, of people who are Tagalog speakers, um, identify some best practices for cognitive testing of bilingual speakers, even just in general, um, and then start to recognize some of the cultural considerations we might uh, want to think about in our clinical interactions uh, with Filipino Americans. Um, so this is the Philippines. Uh, it's made up of over 7,000 islands. Uh, and then this is where we would find it in relation to eight, the rest of the countries in Asia. Um, it's a beautiful place. It's known for its beaches, uh, for the rice terraces, uh, for diving. Um, and then just a little bit about how we are as a culture. So we uh, are very much, uh, we love food, right? We love dancing. We love karaoke and singing. And those are a lot, I think sometimes uh, some of the things that people might say are a, a core part of, of the culture. Um, okay, so starting to delve into languages, um, these colors that you see here on uh, the map outline some of the main languages that are spoken in different regions. Uh, but it turns out there's quite a few languages, so probably over 175 different languages that are spoken in the Philippines. Um, the official languages are Filipino, um, which is a standardized form of Tagalog. Um, although often here in the US, when Filipinos are talking to each other, we'll call the language um, Tagalog to help differentiate it from the other languages. Um, the other official language is English. Uh, and then Spanish used to be an official language. Um, uh, it was a colony of Spain for over for about 300 years. Um, Tagalog is an Austronesian language um, in terms of its language family. Um, and the language experience there is quite rich. So only about 25% of people speak Tagalog as a first language, uh, while another 50% speak it as a second language. So once again, speaking to just the many languages that are spoken. Um, it's also spoken quite widely here in the US. So it's the fourth most spoken uh, behind English, Spanish. Uh, I think they group the Chinese languages together um, and then uh, Filipino or Tagalog. Um, and despite a lot of people having a lot of bilingualism, there's still about 20% um, that are not English proficient here in the US. Um, so multilingualism is really the norm. Um, you'll often hear it taglish where there's mixing of English and um, Tagalog in, in a sentence. Um, and then it may sound a little bit um, familiar sometimes. There's a lot of cognates. Uh, and then also, um, so words that are borrowed from Spanish and English that are, sound the same. 
um, or also false cognates where it sounds the same, but actually needs something different. Um, so a uh, slightly shifting topic. I'll just pause here for a second and, and give you a chance to think about maybe what this map shows. Um, so this actually shows uh, the countries where um, Tagalog is spoken. Um, and I put this slide in to just show um, that a lot of Filipinos work abroad. Um, so there's uh, Filipino nurses, um, sailors, um, nannies, maids, hotel staff, um, construction workers. Um, probably English skills have been also important and helpful in, um, in helping people work outside of the country. Um, and about 10% of the Philippine GDP actually comes from overseas workers. So it's not uncommon for kids to be um, in the Philippines with their grandparents while their parents are working to help support. Um, or we have family back, a lot of people have family back in the Philippines that they're helping to support. Um, so just thinking about where the diaspora is. Um, and then narrowing down into the US, um, here in the US, Filipinos are the third largest population of Asian Americans. Um, there's about 4 million. Um, and then uh, as to where uh, the biggest concentrations are, um, you can see these uh, circles, these dots. Um, so you can see that there are uh, big populations here in California. And then here within California, they're the second largest Asian American population. Um, and the history here is um, quite rich. They go, the history of Filipinos in California goes uh, back a long way. Um, maybe some one of the more famous ones is Larry Itliang. Um, he was a Filipino farm worker um, who worked side by side with Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta to work with uh, farm workers rights. Um, so they have a long history here in California as well. Um, and where I practice here in San Francisco, um, there's also a lot of history here um, and a lot of influence. So one of the languages that you'll hear on public transportation here um, is actually um, Tagalog. Um, although many Filipinos have also left San Francisco, um, we don't have a Manila town anymore, um, you know, lost to gentrification displacement, um, but the, that international hotel there is an important building for history. Um, it was a symbol for affordable housing. Um, so now there's a big concentration in the Soma district here in San Francisco. Um, it's the Filipino Cultural Heritage District with a lot of different uh, organizations and businesses that are related to um, the Filipino community. Um, so moving on to the topic of dementia uh, and Filipinos. Um, so it turns out that, well, there's very little disaggregated data. Um, so this is from one study looking at um, case from the Kaiser Northern California system, um, looking at rates of dementia among different Asian American groups. Um, and it looks like Filipinos have this highest incidence of dementia among Asian American groups. Um, but it's not really necessarily clear why this is. In many ways, the community should have some protective factors. Um, there's a high rate of education, um, although it's, it seems to be a little bit lower in, in Filipino Americans, but definitely higher edu high education. Um, the poverty rate is on the lower side. Um, there's some controversy about how those statistics are, are made because the households tend to be bigger. Um, but things that maybe are contributing um, vascular risk factors. Um, so hypertension, diabetes, um, dyslipidemia, those rates are very high. Uh, and so that could be contributing to the rates of dementia. Um, and then I put depression here, not, not to say that that's an explanation for why um, there are high rates of dementia, but more as a comorbidity um, that can come along with this. Um, along with this, it, it's probably still likely underreported. Um, there's needs for increased knowledge about dementia in the community. So it may not necessarily be, be caught in, in earlier stages, like an MCI type of stage as well. Um, but this is where it would be helpful to have disaggregated data to really understand these topics uh, in more detail. Um, so moving on to cognitive testing, what do we do when uh, we think that someone might have some cognitive impairment? Um, these are some of the cognitive testing measures that have been developed um, for at least for Tagalog speakers. Um, so the ones on the left are created or normed in the Philippines. Um, and then the ones on the right are some measures that have been validated 
um, or are translated from ones that are um, more Western-based uh, types of cognitive assessment. Um, so this is great to be able to have a starting place. I will say though that although there is some normative data and some adapted tests, um, these are mostly for speakers in the Philippines. Um, and we know that um, translated and adapted tasks can be right, culturally, linguistically um, unsuitable or less suitable. Um, so to point out um, syntax, right, the grammar in Tagalog is very different from English. So if you're trying to understand if someone's uh, language deficits are related to dementia or not, it's going to be hard to use uh, measures that have been developed for English, for example. Um, and then also there's the mini mental, uh, which was wonderfully um, actually adapted for, uh, for Tagalog for Filipino, uh, but then also remembering that some of the items that may be relevant to people living in the Philippines may not be as relevant for Filipinos living in the US. Um, so I give an example here um, of seasons. Um, so in the Philippines, it's just wet or dry, right? but if you're asking about a season here in the US, uh, probably should just focus on um, the four seasons that are we consider here in the US. Um, so at this point, there haven't been studies that have validated measures for dementia for ADRD in Filipino Americans. And I think you can imagine that this can be um, a bit of a barrier right, to, to having uh, good health care. Um, so I'll just give a, a quick plug. Um, so we are working on this um, in, in our group, in our lab. Um, to help develop a cognitive battery for Tagalog speakers here in the U.S. Um, so if at some point um, you have questions about this or would like some help with an evaluation for someone who is um, Tagalog speaking, we're always happy to help. And we have ways of doing this as well over telehealth if you're not here in the Bay Area. Um, so this is a paper that will um, that helps to talk about our process for developing the battery and how we've taken steps to make it linguistically, culturally appropriate um, so some of this will also play into what we talk about today. Um, all right, so moving on to some language considerations for cognitive assessment. Uh, so a few more important pieces of information right, about how Filipinos um, and uh, Tagalog speakers use their languages. Um, we've mentioned some of this before, uh, but just a reminder um, also again that there's often very high levels of bilingualism, although it's quite varied with 20% um, not being English proficient. And then also remembering that even if you are trying to test someone in Tagalog, it's not necessarily their first language or their L1. Um, and then keeping in mind that there may be a lot of code switching between languages or use of Taglish. Um, so I think practically speaking, uh, when you're seeing someone in clinic, um, I think it's good to consider about accepting responses in, in Tagalog and English. Um, even some contexts where we might actually use Spanish more easily. Um, and then also remembering the effects of things like education. Um, we talked about bilingualism, um, acculturation, enculturation, and how that affects um, testing results. Uh, and then this always comes up. So sometimes I get told, yeah, I'm worried about their language, um, that they are um, maybe as a sign of cognitive impairment because they can't keep he and she straight uh, when they're talking. Um, so I'll just say that that's really common. Um, there's, we don't have gendered pronouns in, um, in Tagalog. So he and she is, is just cha. So it, um, that's actually just, it's just difficult um, when speaking English and it's very common for people to, to mix that up. Um, so I'll just be giving some case examples from um, our cohort. Uh, and I just wanted to use this to illustrate some of the language considerations. Um, so this is a cohort that we have right now at UCSF, um, where they've also filled out a really extensive bilingualism questionnaire to help us understand how those language pieces fit into their cognitive testing. Um, so I'll just point out um, uh, the, the age of acquisition for English is very much in childhood for the cohort. Um, they're multilingual and speak a variety of languages, which are listed here. Um, I think these biggest, oh, the numbers aren't here, but the biggest pie pieces of the pie are Spanish, and I believe this one's French. Um, and then a lot of these are actually other Philippine languages. Most have lived here in the US for uh, 20 plus years um, and rate their proficiency as quite high in English. Um, this is a scale one to six, and the range that we see is three to six. Um, 
So I'll also just give some examples with some cognitive tasks or cognitive tests that um, at least are commonly used in our clinic um, and hopefully are also related to some of the tasks um, that maybe you were thinking of giving or the neuropsychologists are thinking of giving. Um, so the mini mantle, uh, this is, um, we, we use one that's used originally from the Philippines. Um, things we've learned along the way um, that it, it can actually even be difficult sometimes to give the date um, in, in Tagalog, like in pure Tagalog. Um, so this is, is an example of a response, and this has happened more than once, uh, where the response is a mix of English and then some kind of more Spanish in there um, and then some Tagalog in there. Um, so, you know, for practical purposes, can they give you the date in whichever language? And hopefully that can give you some information. Uh, we talked briefly about season. Um, right, the, the, the responses on the, um, mini, the Filipino version is wet or dry, um, but here in the US probably makes more sense to think of one of the four seasons. Um, and then to also make it a little more relevant, um, we replaced it back with county and state for a couple of the orientation questions. Um, also point out how naming can be a little bit difficult. Um, so um, to this point, we've been, one of the measures we use frequently is something called the multilingual naming test, uh, which works quite well in a lot of different languages. I, there's um, English, Spanish, um, I think there's a, a Chinese version, a Hebrew version. Um, uh, although we find that um, the Tagalog speakers have a lot of trouble even with these naming tasks. Um, this is scored out of 32, um, and right, these are people who are healthy, um, I'll say, and their average score is really around 15 um, out of that 32, uh, while the norms for English, I believe, are around 90%, so around 29 or so. Um, so healthy controls uh, have difficulty when, with naming, right? um, even when they're uh, you know, allowed to give the response as well in English. Um, still not quite what you might expect as someone who would be um, at least a healthy control doing this um, in English. Um, so why might this be, or just some other considerations? Um, th this is another test that has a lot of cognates, and that's something that uh, we will try to avoid, at least when we're doing this in the research setting, uh, because we want people to be able to pull the word um, from that language that you're testing in and not necessarily pull from another language that they speak. Um, but just to say some some cultural pieces of this, um, yeah, I, they got a little frustrated sometimes. Um, so this is uh, the picture of the portholes. Um, it, it's a country that has 7,000 islands. Um, we know what a boat is, but this is not something that is commonly perceived as a porthole. Um, comments that sometimes it's just not so so culturally relevant. Like, why am I being asked about a scarf um, when we don't have scarves in the Philippines? Uh, and then a, a few different comments about how it felt very American um, doing these types of tasks. Um, so lessons learned from this. Um, so I think it's important when you're doing some naming tasks, right? Whether it's the MOCA um, or the MMSE, um, and if you're trying to do this in Tagalog, right? it's, I think it's important to ask if they are still able to name it in either English or Tagalog. Um, just to give you a sense of whether or not you should be um, concerned about some type of cognitive impairment. Um, it's also important to ask if they're familiar with the item. And so from the porthole example, it's that they really didn't really recognize what it was that was being asked. Um, some of the tasks for naming um, allow for things like phonemic cues. So saying, um, you know, it starts with p or, for, or I guess, yeah, for cactus, for example, it starts with k. Um, Although that can sometimes be a little bit harder um, for the Tagalog speakers, I think we're finding to, to respond to the way you might expect, um, since it's a language where the, we tie the consonant together with the vowel. Um, so to just hear the consonant might get a little um, strange. Um, and then also just learning to, or remembering, right, to just respect how people feel about their languages. Um, I think sometimes people felt bad that they didn't know the name in Tagalog. Um, even though that's the language that maybe they, they feel they most identify with. Um, right? So just keeping that in mind as well. Um, so just because they don't know the word in one language or another um, doesn't mean that they aren't good speakers of that language. It's just, um, this is the task that we're giving them at that moment. Um, okay, so this is a big table. 
just wanted to uh, walk through it with you to give some other examples um, and illustrate the importance of considering language when doing cognitive testing. Um, so these are still from our cohort. Um, so if you remember, they're healthy, um, they're healthy adults, they're highly proficient, um, bilingual English Tagalog. Um, so this, this box right now is highlighting the tasks that were given to the same individuals in both um, Tagalog and in English. Um, and I think you might be able to see here, for example, like on animal fluency, um, that their performance depends on what language of the what the language of testing might be, um, yeah, or or digit span, for example. Um, so to keep that in mind. Uh, and then here we're comparing the scores from the bilingual Tagalog English cohort with scores from a monolingual English cohort. Um, and I'll just say that these two cohorts have similar years of education, they're the same age, um, and they're being given the same tasks, um, but there seems to be differences that maybe are dependent a bit on their bilingual status or not. Um, so to show a little more here, um, right, so looking again, these are, these are MMSE scores that are similar uh, in either English or Tagalog, but then there's some differences in some of these other measures. Um, so some other things to point out uh, for letter fluency. Um, yeah, so I said, don't use upper. So not so much that I'm worried that someone will say swear words. It's just that um, I think the, one of the versions of the MOCA in English has um, F words um, they, to help generate uh, for letter fluency. Um, it ends up being quite a difficult letter um, for Filipinos to, uh, to use. Uh, because the original Tagalog alphabet didn't have the letter F, and so we'll often mix up Fs and Ps. So even if you think about where you see Filipino spelled with a P versus an F, right? Um, so just know that it's going to be a particularly difficult task um, if you're asking someone to do it uh, quite this way. Um, animal fluency, for whatever reason, it, um, we get a lot of insects. Um, from these healthy controls under animal fluency. So we've decided to say that you know, we should probably score them as a correct response. Um, and then digits. I, I think this is kind of interesting as well, um, just how people can perform differently on these tasks, depending on what language. Um, so some explanations for why the digits forward and backward are lower when you're testing in Tagalog versus English. Um, maybe relating to the number of syllables per word. Um, so these, for Tagalog, most of the name, most of the numbers are two or three syllables. Well, in English, it's usually, I guess, like one um, or maybe two. Um, and then also the context for how numbers are used. Um, to tell time, uh, we use Spanish numbers, actually, um, for the date or for shopping when you're, um, when you're bartering or um, asking for how much something costs, we'll often use Spanish numbers. So um, it gets a little confusing um, about which language to use for numbers. Um, and then, yeah, we already talked about the mint. So um, this is the troop where you're asking people to um, do a couple tasks. One where the screen shows um, the names of letters that are in the same color, so concordant with the color of the ink uh, versus not, and that's the interference portion. Right, where there's a mismatch between the color of the ink and the name that you see there. Um, so there could be some difficulties with um, having more than one word in your brain uh, for that color. That makes it harder to do some of these tasks. Um, and then here, we, we're noticing that, um, so that Filipino American Tagalog speakers um, seem to actually have higher scores on this figure copy where you're asking people to draw a really complicated figure um, as a test of visuospatial functioning. Um, and we wonder a little bit if there's some cultural differences in this as well, right? That there's a value in being very meticulous in drawing these figures um, instead of doing it quickly and instead of a speed aspect. Um, so just another way how sometimes testing can be different. Um, so from this, I'll move in, into a broader, kind of, I guess a little bit of a side topic about some of the best practices for cognitive testing and people who are bilingual speakers. So I guess regardless of what language combinations they speak. Um, so knowing that L1, so your first language influences how you'll perform if you're being tested in your second language, um, but also the other way around. Um, that 
uh, bilingual speakers may have some, I guess, a disadvantage, or they may, may not score as highly on things like picture naming, even if they are doing it in what they feel is their dominant language. Um, and this is even harder for people who speak both languages well, as opposed to someone who's a bit more unbalanced, where there's one that's uh, stronger for them or not. Um, we, we mentioned as well some of those verbal fluency tasks, like letter naming and animal, um, animal fluency, um, and then tasks like the that Stroop test that we showed where there's some interference um, between the two languages, pulling out that uh, word as quickly as possible. Um, so of course, you know, it'd be wonderful if people were able to get testing in both of their languages to have a really good idea of what's going on cognitively. Um, of course, that means that we'd have to have a lot of time and I, I get that that's not always possible. Uh, and then also remembering that there's not necessarily standardized tests um, for all of these languages. Um, so what do we do? Um, let's say that we can still try to test someone in English because that's what we have some tasks for. Um, so we can at least try to think through and determine what someone's language proficiency is, what their dominance is for those languages. Um, it's probably good to um, at least get subjective info on this, um, their self-rating of how um, they do in that language. Um, but also remembering that people who are immersed in a world where their second language is spoken, so let's say thinking about um, the Tagalog speakers being here in the U.S., for example, they may underestimate their abilities in that second language. Um, and then um, bilingual speakers who are older also tend to underestimate their proficiency levels in both languages. Um, so best practice would be having um, a professionally trained bilingual social linguistically competent neuropsychologist uh, to do these tests um, or referring out to someone uh, who has those skill, that skill set. Um, and then as a backup, having a professional interpreter that can help out. Um, and then a note about the bilingualism of the examiner. Um, so if you're trying to decide, okay, is this something that I could do um, or not, um, or that the examiner could do or not, um, you could try to ask, you know, is this someone, or do you feel like you could enroll in a college graduate program that was given in that language of testing? Um, there's guidelines, there's the actual proficiency guidelines, which can help guide um, your proficiency as well. Um, and even if that isn't the case, someone can still collect some good factual information, right? We still get a lot of history from interviewing, um, from getting good history to help determine if someone has cognitive impairment or not. Uh, and then just also remembering the social cultural aspect of this um, and having um, humility and competency about that as well. So um, a few other tips and notes. Um, if we really still are not sure if someone has cognitive impairment or not based on their testing, um, it's at least a good baseline that you can, re or in many cases, repeat testing in a year and see if, there, if there's changes there. Um, you can also try to look for patterns on testing. Right? Is it clear that they have more trouble with memory tasks as opposed to frontal executive tasks? And maybe that can go along with their imaging, uh, with their other diagnostic tools. And when you put that together, it seems to make sense for a story of what's happening. Um, and then this is also where getting a history it remains important. So asking about changes in daily functioning um, is another clue about whether um, someone's performance on their cognitive testing could be related to cognitive impairment or not. Um, so to quickly summarize this, section and what we've talked about in terms of language considerations. Um, so hopefully remembering that cognitive testing scores are going to be influenced by the languages, um, that bilingualism affects testing performance in both languages, um, that best case would be to evaluate in both languages and with um, someone who is um, a neuropsychologist who is also social linguistically competent as well. Um, but then if that's not possible, still getting a good history trying to look for patterns on testing, um, thinking about our other diagnostic tools like imaging um, or labs, and then um, considering repeat testing in about a year to, to look for any kinds of changes. All right, um, so we'll switch gears now to some cultural considerations for cognitive assessments. Um, and this is where I'll also, I should have said at the beginning too, right? So I do consider myself a part of the community. And I think you might've heard that sometimes I refer to things as we, and that's probably why. 
um, but also recognizing that I'm just one person, right? So of course, these topics are going to be through my own lens and may not necessarily reflect the feelings of the entire community. Um, that uh, There's individual pieces of this as well. Um, so we, we did, I did have a chance to discuss this quite a bit with um, some of our community members, uh, with our other colleagues and lab members. Um, so we did our best to represent thoughts on these topics. Um, so some concepts and some core um, cultural values and how they might interact with clinic um, and Filipino Americans. Um, I'll say that to start out, these concepts don't really translate so well in terms of getting a definition. Um, so we tried. Um, so this concept of um, kapwa, of togetherness, of um, the sense that um, we're all in it together, that um, everyone's important, that you, we need to treat each other well. Um, how this interacts with maybe our clinic interactions. Um, so it's very important, I think, that other needs come first, um, that we are caring for each other. Um, and then this is also where having family often involved as caregivers and often involved in decisions, I think, goes along with this value. Um, there's a value of um, pakikisama, so conformity and deference to what um, the other people around you also want, um, what the majority is, um, and prioritizing those interpersonal relationships, keeping them smooth. Um, how this sometimes shows up in clinic, um, they may, I guess we may not as be, be as confrontational about things um, or correct or interject if something isn't quite um, right, um, let's say in the history or in how we feel about something. Um, so how we sense um, the, it, the feelings and the needs of other people. So you don't really need to say how you feel. It's kind of just like sensing what other people feel. Um, so when this shows up in clinic, um, if you're trying to ask someone what their mood and their feelings are, um, it, it's, it's almost like we don't really feel or want to directly say it. It, it should be something that you should read from body language um, uh, to see how someone's actually feeling. Um, so this is the feeling of needing to return favors that you owe people, that there's obligations. Um, so in, in many ways, right, this is, this is a good thing as well, like in that, like people want to take care of people, um, maybe being support for their parents, um, if they're starting to become cognitively impaired. Um, but I think there's also the caregiver burden piece that we don't always talk about. Um, so to keep that in mind, um, I, yeah, yeah, this is like not a very good translation of it, but it's the sense of feeling like, um, I guess, kind of like shame or embarrassment or needing to pay attention to social norms um, and how that shows up. It might mean minimizing the symptoms of dementia that someone might be experiencing because they don't want to talk about it. There's stigma associated with that. Um, and then um, the nang um, So this is kind of being um, uh, showing endurance, showing resilience. Um, being, um, bearing through hardships, uh, and then also calling on faith to get through things. Um, so uh, in clinic, for example, um, you might see people referring to their faith when you're giving a diagnosis or giving some bad news, um, but also feeling that they can get through it um, and that they're strong and they can deal. Um, okay, so I will kind of uh, briefly go through these things just as a concept that I think um, might be a little bit unfamiliar for a lot of people. Um, so this concept of colonial mentality and how this plays into um, clinical relationships as well. Um, so th this is defined as having this perception of ethnic cultural inferiority. Um, the Philippines was under colonial rule for um, about 400 years right, under the Spaniards and then the Americans. Um, so this is often the sense that anything American or anything English is better. Um, and uh, the studies on this feel that it's quite rampant, that maybe about 30 to 50% of Filipinos have these types of symptoms, depending on how that question is being asked or if it's being looked for more subtly. Um, so how this sometimes shows up in clinic, there's a, a high preference often to use English. Um, it's often listed as the primary language in APEX, that's our electronic medical record, um, and then uh, declining use of a translator. Um, even if Tagalog still is their dominant language. Um, and I'll say, yeah, an example from last week, I, I was speaking with one of our research participants who was really saddened because he didn't get to fully express what he wanted to say 
to his doctor and clinic um, because the study was being conducted in English, um, but like he, he didn't want to use a translator. Um, so yeah, there's also maybe this idea that um, we want to make it easier on other people. And so to do that, it's easier to use English for the other person. Um, and then this also comes up where sometimes you might feel it's better to do testing in the Tagalog to get a better idea, a better picture of what's going on. Um, but then sometimes people feel that that implies like you don't think their English is good enough. Um, so in terms of an explanation, something we'll try to say is, you know, kind of normalizing it. This is standardized testing. It's not really a reflection of your language proficiency. We're not trying to single you out. Right? It's that you actually speak more than one language and we want to have a good idea of what's going on. Uh, and then this sometimes happens as well, where there's this preference or a deference to having um, American providers and not someone that looks like them. Um, okay, so some other beliefs um, that also uh, tie into dementia. Um, there's a sense that memory loss is a part of normal aging. Um, so that might mean also minimizing symptoms when they're happening. Um, there is a concern about being a burden to others and, and how that might come into play with a diagnosis of dementia. Um, and then also a sense sometimes of, um, so Mahalana is like, you, you, it's out of your control, like God's will, um, whatever happens, happens. Um, so it's almost like a little bit fatalistic, I guess, and that you have this diagnosis, so what can you do? Um, there's still stigma that comes along with a, a, this type of diagnosis, um, but also there's a lot of hope for the future it, it, that there's an idea that you, know, you don't have to be um, stuck like this, that there's always some, a way to make this positive or, or make this a better situation. Um, and then there's also a lot of value in resilience um, and having personal strength and getting through things. Um, and then I just wanted to also say about word choice and how this sometimes plays into some beliefs. So we have some families where um, using words like dementia or Alzheimer's makes it much more real. Um, it's like bringing it into being. Um, so maybe being a little bit careful with that. Um, right? Using gentle words, tones of voice, your tone of voice is important, uh, which I guess is true for everybody. Um, so just keeping some of these pieces in mind as well. Um, some other considerations for clinic. Um, hospitality is a big thing in the culture. So when you walk into a Filipino house, often the first thing is they ask you, have you eaten? And then even if you have, they bring you food, right? Um, so if there's ways to make it more hospitable in clinic as well, like offering even just some water to um, have someone feel a little more at home. Um, the way we show respect as well um, is, is quite important, um, right? when, especially when we're making requests of elders. Um, and then this is built into the language. So the Tagalog has honorifics, so kind of like the usted form in Spanish, um, right? Korean has it. So there's other ways in the Tagalog to start to show that you are um, respectful of someone. Um, but we don't really have that in English. So, you know, I think body language, the other things we do to, to show respect. Um, this picture is actually um, of someone, so menopause is like when you, um, when you meet, when you're greeting somebody, you're asking the blessing of, from your elder um, when you greet them, and it's just a sign of respect. Um, Nonverbal cues are often important, um, won't always voice when, we're dis when there's discomfort. Um, so uh, trying to pay attention to tone of voice or facial expressions or body language as a way to get it to how somebody is feeling. Um, and then polite ways of saying no. Uh, so saying we will think about it or we shall see probably means no. Um, so trying to read between the lines when someone says that. Um, and then also that they may be a little more reserved, a little bit more formal when um, they're with strangers or someone they don't have a rapport with yet. Um, so sometimes this shows up with not being so open about talking about what brought them to clinic, for example. Um, so we might need to ask a little more question to really get the full story. Um, so our summary here um, is thinking through about how cultural values can affect um, or influence clinic interactions, um, this concept of colonial mentality um, and how that plays in as well. Um, and then how Filipino values can also shape dementia beliefs. And then we just also talked briefly about some ways to try to show some cultural humility um, in clinic as well. So to summarize what we talked about today, 
uh, we talked a bit about um, the Filipino uh, Filipino diaspora and um, Filipinos, Filipino Americans here in the US. Uh, we talked about how there's uh, a high incidence of dementia um, in the community. Um, we talked a little bit about language considerations for cognitive assessments that currently there's still a lack of appropriate and, and normed cognitive tasks for Filipinos in the US and that bilingualism can affect testing performance even uh, regardless of what language combinations people are speaking. We also spoke a little bit about some cultural considerations uh, for cognitive assessments. Um, some of the cultural values that might come into play during clinic interactions um, and how they might interact as well with some of the beliefs around dementia and then ended a little bit with some uh, pieces of cultural humility in clinic. Um, so I'll say thank you. This was so interesting. I have so many questions. We have not gotten any questions yet, actually. So um, I, I'm free to ask my own. Um, and I, I, in general, just want to thank you for, um, I think something we, the, you know, this is a really particular lens on the issue of which affects, I think, so many other folks that that we have, you know, very much in California, but obviously also across the U.S. as well. Which is just multiculturalism overall, or and multilingualism. And um, I, so this was a, a really such an important spotlight on Filipino Americans and their and specific combinations of of language diversity and multi lingual sort of existence, which was just so fascinating. Um, and I, one question sprung to mind, because I think we see so many people who, um, for different diaspora reasons, you know, are really, one language is sort of the one that they're growing up with, with their parents and whoever's raising them and in their home, and but they're living somewhere where there's another language that's primarily spoken. And then they're moved to the US. Um, and are speaking, you know, to some degree, learning and surrounded by English. And I'm wondering if sort of cognitively, it seems like the issue of bi or multilingualism, is that sort of like you would have your own way of approaching um, understanding that person's cognition, basically, because it seemed, you know, you're making very specific considerations for the combinations of Spanish, Filipino languages, English in, you know, in the tests that you're doing with, with your Filipino cohort. So I guess I'm just wondering if when you think about this as an expert, are you thinking of bilingualism or multilingualism as it's almost like its own cognitive, you know, realm? I don't know if that makes, if I worded that well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, right? And it's often not something we discuss as openly, you know, maybe we know our patient enough to know that they are bilingual, um, but we may not necessarily mention it right away when we're doing cognitive testing. Um, it almost is even harder when they are balanced and they speak both languages quite well or speak English quite well. Right? It may not even come up that they speak these other languages. Um, so I think trying to make it more at least a, a sentence that we mention when we're talking about someone's cognitive testing results. Like, by the way, they also happen to speak these other languages um, quite well, and so it may affect how they do on testing. Um, you also mentioned a good point too, right? The language that we speak at home may not necessarily be the same language that we took classes in or, or have our education in, uh, or the same language that we speak at work. Right? So then when it comes to test, figuring out which language to test in, um, wh which language do you choose um, and, what we try to do, I think, is try to choose maybe one that they used a lot of schooling in as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, it gets it gets hard and complicated, and a lot of times I don't have good answers to yeah how to do this well. But I think you were you gave such a practical approach, like some practical answers about or guidance about you know tips and tricks you can do or considerations to do a better job to give them people a fairer assessment or overall picture, and then also just getting a sense of, you know, what the baseline is, trajectory, um, you know, making some accommodations that are particularly necessary, like not using P words or, um, you know, offering to accept any answer in any language kind of. Um, so anyway, I just want to reiterate that because I thought those were all really helpful. 
Yeah, yeah um, knowing it's, it's not going to be perfect, right? But there are certainly things we can do to make it a little bit easier. Um, and we often, right, we'll, we'll use where we just see what someone's baseline is. And if we can't figure it out, then like, we'll try to follow up and see if that second visit will give us a better clue about what's going on. I have a question about this issue of interpreters. Um, and, and it's a two part question because you also touched on that in a way that was really, um, I think many of us have experienced, especially if we're, if we're working with Filipino or Filipino American patients um, of all ages, which is the issue of, is there a culturally and, you know, I mean, always we're, we're trying to be person centered and respectful, no matter how we're approaching it, but like, is there particularly a way that we could offer an interpreter in an acceptable way? Because I could, I just constantly have the experience of people not wanting the interpreter and you're pointing out in so many ways in which it might help. Um, and also I keep, I'm this example of the person who wasn't able to share everything they wanted to share that. I think that's really going to stick with me because, you know, that's a real missed opportunity. Um, so any suggestions about how to in introduce the interpreter? Yeah. So, um, when, okay, so if you actually get a clue, right, either from reading their chart or from their preferred language that um, they probably are going to need an interpreter, I guess I'll just already have them there. Um, and then, you know, if they're waiting for me to, to be there in, in clinic, then they already have a couple minutes to just chat with that interpreter who's already waiting uh, to help them. Um, and then they just build enough rapport in that couple minutes that they are totally like, okay, come on in um, and you can come join us. Um, so sometimes if they can get more comfortable with that interpreter, then they're okay with them joining um, in. Um, but that's like when they already say, you know, on their chart that they're going to need an interpreter and you can plan for it that way. Um, the other thing is I, I'm trying to learn that, um, yeah, I think that example also has been weighing in on, in on me and there's been more, right? Um, that, you know, recognizing that I want you to be able to say everything you want to say. And sometimes, right, um, you, it's easier for you to express some things in Tagalog because we don't have words like that in English. And so I want you to be able to say it. Um, but yeah, I admit it's, it's hard. And, and maybe sometimes it's the second visit or the third visit where you get enough of a relationship that they say it's okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's hard. <laughs> well, and I also wrote that maybe I'm asking the wrong person because probably you can um, into, you know, use your interpretive skills yourself but um i like the idea of having the person there i always try to normalize it and say you know if you have other language you know languages that you speak um fluently i'd like to just have the interpreter they may not contribute very much if we if it's not needed um and i but the other question i have then is you know usually we're on the phone and so my question was going to be if let's say um, I'm doing some of these brief cognitive tests and maybe we'll just stick with the, the mini cog, like any tips for the mini cog, which would be a three item recall and a clock draw on the phone, you know, and I'm using a phone interpreter. Is there anything about that, that um, like I would want to give instructions to the interpreter, which of course my patient is likely to understand, but um, I guess the reason being, um, it seems like 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 you're saying, oh, I'm I'm willing to accept whatever answer the person gives for a date. Um, so if there's one test we recommend with the cognitive health assessment called the GP cog, and there we do ask people to give us the date. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering if like a lot of interpreters are prepared for some of these nuances. So I think, well, first of all, right, we, we try to use very simple um, instructions to the interpreter, so very simple sentences to make sure it gets, um, I guess, translated as best as possible. That my guess is for time, uh, we, are, we usually use Spanish, so the interpreter will probably use Spanish um, to say the time. Um, and I think that that's okay, um, that you don't need, I, I think you probably don't need to specify what language to the interpreter, because at least hopefully they also have the cultural aspect of it too, right? That they know when you want them, you want to say in, in Tagalog what the time is, they kind of already know that you mean, well, but we use Spanish numbers, so they'll say it to them just kind of automatically in Spanish, um, if, if that makes sense. 
Um, yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. Because yeah. they're, they're able to interpret the whole, the cultural and various language concerns. Um, if you fast forward a little bit, a couple slides, I think maybe I just wanted everybody in the audience to know they can claim their continuing education credits and it's in the chat as well. Um, there's also information about our warm line. I just want to make sure people can can access the uh, instructions. So I just have a couple other things to say. So people put in the chat, thank you for bringing attention to the, um, I'm probably going to say it wrong, my apologies, Phil Am community, um, shedding light on Phil, Am, Phil Ams. Um, I hope I said that correctly. Very informative. I want to second that. I think the other thing is I don't think I realize in the Bay Area, we have a very large and visible Filipino American population, but I wasn't, you know, I don't think I realized how large in the US overall. And I personally feel so grateful for the Filipino American community because they're like here, there's such an integral, clear, obvious part of healthcare overall. And um, like, so just, yeah, I mean, just a, a wonderful part of the fabric of, of, you know, the Bay Area. So I feel so grateful for this information and just like, knowing more about um you know the folks who are in our community here um so i wanted to echo that that sentiment of very deep appreciation and i'll say thank you for this opportunity it's, it's always fun to be able to chat about it somebody else just asked if it's okay to use our cognitive health assessment for people under 65 if there's anything special no you absolutely can use it for people under 65 it's a good screening tool if somebody's if something's coming up um, as a symptom or a sign or if you want to screen a, a population at an earlier age because it's a higher risk population the the populations we see all the time with a higher burden of cognitive and functional decline at earlier ages are people with certain um, uh, lived experiences like experiencing homelessness having been in justice involved or in the um, carceral system um, and, um, yeah, so multiple populations that people also older people with HIV, sometimes we start screening earlier, um, because of a combination of risk factors, including HIV infection. So, um, just wanted the audience to know totally usable in a younger population, either population approach, screening everybody, or just as a tool to, to start to assess a cognitive or functional decline you know, concern. Um, we will wrap it up there because we're at time. And just again, just huge thank you to you, Dr. DeLeon, and a huge thank you to the audience. Um, please continue to connect with us at Dementia Care Where if we can be of support in any way. And um, have a wonderful afternoon, everyone.